Well, I just want to uh, thank Allie for uh, taking her time to come out and kind of help the call, um, <clears throat> help lead the call for tonight. I'm going to share my screen in a minute and we'll kind of start through the, the uh, presentation. I, um, I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Allie, let me know. Can you see that okay? I can see you, Kevin. All right, great. Thank you. So we are going to talk about lower back pain today. Um, and we have, uh, we'll start just with, you know, I'll talk a little bit about myself. We'll get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of lower back pain and the anatomy of low back pain. We'll get into the, the top three low back problem, the low back pain problems we see in our clinic in physical therapy. We'll get into some various topics like posture, breathing, stretching, strengthening exercises. I'd like to spend some time talking about chronic pain uh, because we see a lot of that in our clinic. And then talk briefly, briefly about fitness goals because we not only do we work with PT, but then we try to encourage a lot of continued exercise after someone's done with physical therapy. <clears throat> we'll finish with just whether or not PT is right for you or not. And we'll talk also about if you're ready to get your physical therapy, uh, get your lower back pain handled um, at this point. Um, and, and like Ali said, I'll just remind you all, you're muted now. We'll unmute everyone towards the end. But if you have some questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And um, when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll go through those. Also, uh, what I will do is um, sometime tomorrow or on Monday, Ali will shoot you guys a, an email that will have the presentation as well as the three exercises we'll go into a little bit later. Uh, so you'll get a copy of that later on. Um, and then finally, we, uh, we're taping the call tonight and we like to put that on our YouTube channel. So if you know of someone that maybe had lower back pain, could make the call, um, we'll send you that link uh, as well um, when we're done. So generally when I do these workshops, my, these are my goals for them is, you know, I want you to become a little bit more educated about what we're talking about. And obviously we're talking about lower back pain tonight. I feel that you don't have to live with severe pain. That's a very important thing because I know there's quite a few people out there that live in severe, severe pain and I don't think you have to. I always think that seeking out medical advice from a qualified professional is really important. Um, your neighbor or your boss or your aunt may have had low back pain in the past, but it's never the same. And so speaking with someone that has worked with physical therapy or chiropractic or massage or anything like that and getting a qualified uh, recommendation, I think is super important. And, you know, I always say that, you know, physical therapy is not the only provider out there. There are chiropractors, there are massage therapists. My wife currently owns a company called Open Circle Acupuncture, where they do acupuncture treatments. So there's a lot of different ways to treat low back pain. And, you know, sometimes we work and sometimes we don't. So I think it's important to know that there are, are some other really good practitioners out there. And then obviously today, you know, we want you to be able to, to take home some things that you can start doing later after the presentation. Uh, so that's important for me too. So just quickly, lower back pain is, uh, a, it, it's, a $50 billion problem. And, that, and this information is from 2010. So it's actually 10 years old, but um, it just goes to show you how much money is spent um, in the treatment of lower back pain um, in, through the years. And interestingly enough, most cases of back pain are actually, they're what we call mechanical, uh, which means there's something wrong with a joint or something wrong with the muscle. And they're non-organic, which means they're, they're not from an infection or a fracture or a cancer. So, you know, those uh, infection, fracture, cancer issues are very, very low on a percentage point when it comes to low back pain. And the majority of low back pain is either musculoskeletal um, or just related to joint stiffness. Um, this is a classic study that was done, and again, a long time ago, 1994, Many times when we see people in the clinic, they will we'll come in and we'll ask them their history and we'll ask them, have you had any testing done? And many times, more often than not, people will see us first before they have testing done and they're referred from their doctor. And many times they'll say, well, I don't know why 
my doctor didn't have me have an MRI first. And this study is the reason why. 1994, they, they took almost 100 people, they gave them an MRI. Now, those 100 people had zero complaints of lower back pain, had none at all. And when they reviewed each person's MRI, they found that close to almost 70% of that had something wrong with a disc problem or a bone problem, but they had no pain. And so that's why many times the doctors find that a doing an MRI on someone who is over the age of 45 is going to show some degenerative changes, which is very normal. And we know that. So we don't really, really need an MRI too much unless someone's really struggling with getting it better. And then we'll definitely try to get that MRI done. But for the most part, our treatments we find don't really require the need of an MRI because we can find out through our clinical examination and our assessment what's actually going on. So, you know, obviously this is the anatomy of this spine. You can see there's four different sections of the spine. Our focus tonight is more on the lumbar area and the sacral area or the bottom part of the spine. But you can obviously see there's a cervical region, which is where the, the skull sits on top of. The neck area is also known as cervical. And the thoracic area is where the ribs um, attach to the spine as well. We are seeing um, on the left side of this slide, you'll see what a normal spine from the back looks like. And then on the right, you'll see a spine with some scoliosis or a lateral curvature. Um, we see that less and less nowadays, but we still see it. Um, I think that the schools do a wonderful job at assessing um, young students for scoliosis. And I think that's why we see less and less of it um, because they're just screening. They have much better screening tools than they did um, you know, 30, 40 years ago when, when I was a student um, and being assessed then. So one of the first and probably one of the, the ones, the diagnosis that we see the most is this spondylosis, which is kind of a fancy term for spine arthritis. So generally what you'll find is we find this in people over the age of 50. It's more in women than men. There's general complaints of stiffness through the lower back. Pain is usually in the lower back and the hips, buttock, maybe occasionally in the thigh. And the person usually is quite sedentary. So what, if you look at the picture on the left, what you're seeing is kind of a brown segment and that brown segment is the vertebrae, that's the bone. And then you'll see kind of a, a purplish colored, um, looks like a little disc that sits in between each bone or vertebrae. And what you'll see is the top segment, it's a normal disc, so it's in good height, good thickness all the way through. But if you look at some of the other segments, the next one down is a degenerative one where you see it's a little bit narrower, there's some black part in there. The disc material is mostly water. So as we age and we dehydrate, we see that the disc tends to deteriorate a little bit. Sometimes we can get a bulging disc is where the disc kind of pushes out into the, that back hole. You can see this looks like a white hole where that's where the nerve ex exits out of. And sometimes we can have a herniated disc where there's more of a bulge that pushes out in the nerve. So we'll talk in a minute about sciatica and those are what we generally see with sciatica. When you go all the way down the bottom is where you really start to see that the disc is very, very degenerative and there's some bone changes. You can see that the bone from the upper sections looks kind of clean and, and straight, but as we go down the bottom sections, it tends to be a little bit more um, from just some osteoporosis, um, osteophyte formation, and it looks almost like a top hat. If you see that bottom segment, you will look like kind of like a top hat. And that's generally what we see on x-ray and on MRI with really significant um, degeneration. So I'm gonna just go to a different screen because I'm gonna demo for you your, your first exercise. There he is. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I got it. Thank you, bye. So. Kevin, you're muted. 
Kevin. There you go. There you go. All right, good. Sorry. <laughs> no. Um, so we have uh, we have this great exercise program in our office, and um, we'll send you a copy of this. And the nice thing about it is we have handouts, but we also have video too. So here's the first exercise. I'm going to turn up my volume so you can you guys can hear it okay. Begin lying on your back with your legs straight. Using your hands, slowly pull one knee toward your chest until you feel a gentle stretch in your lower back. Make sure to keep your back relaxed and flat on the ground during the stretch. All right, so that's the first exercise. That's the single knee to chest. And we do that on the back. And that's a really basic one that we do a lot of in our office because we find it to be really effective. Um, so that's the first exercise. What we generally do is we'll have people hold that for a count of about 20 seconds, and then we'll just encourage them to do, you know, four to five on either side. This is an excellent thing to do first thing in the morning. A lot of us that have some back pain have a lot of stiffness in the morning. Stay right in bed. Try to not disturb your spouse or your significant other if they're in bed too, but just pulling that knee into the chest can be a super comfortable uh, way to um, get your back just loosened up and moving a little bit better. There we go. All right. Now, um, when we deal with spondylosis, we talk many times about what's called the facet joints. And so what we're looking at here is there is the segments of the spine, the vertebrae kind of stacked on top of each other. And when one vertebrae stacks on top of the other, you'll see it forms a little hole where it looks like a tree branch is coming out. And that's actually the nerve. And the nerve can get compressed because the, no, the hole will get smaller. And so we try to get those facet joints moving better because many times they're very, very stiff. And our treatment involves mobilizing them and trying to move them and trying to stretch the areas around them. So what, how do we treat spondylosis? And, and what the picture, what you'll see here is just what we kind of looked at, you know, from before with some of those discs, you can see this is an MRI film and you can see how there is some narrowing of some of those spots in between the vertebrae and in the lower segments, you'll see where it's actually pushing into that white line. You'll see a white line in the middle of the screen. That white line is your spinal cord. And so where the, the black part is kind of pushing into that white line is where the disc presses on the nerve and can send some symptoms down the leg or just cause some generalized lower back pain. So we talk, when we treat spondylosis or spine arthritis issues, we talk a lot about retraining posture. We talk about how pain is normal and we try to avoid pain by just improving movement patterns and getting you moving. We try to move the spine. We try to teach our patients how to get their back and their core muscles stronger. And then we always encourage some walking. Um, as people are working through their therapy, we want them out walking, trying to be active, but just making sure they're not doing too much. When we say walk, you know, we haven't been walking for a while, maybe a half of a mile is a great distance to start with. Not going out and trying to walk three miles, that's probably too much. But if you are very active and used to moving more, then you could, it's all based on how do you think, how much do you think you can do without making yourself worse. Now the next problem we talk a lot about or we see is, is what we call sciatica. And um, so this generally tends to be people in the over age 35 category. Um, they have general complaints of low back pain. They also may have some buttock or leg pain as well as some tingling or numbness that's very common. That tingling or numbness is sometimes very specific to a region and we'll talk about that in a second. They're usually very uncomfortable with sleeping where that spinal, you know, the, the spondylosis people, they they sleep very well. Um, people with sciatica are generally very uncomfortable with sleeping. They also have poor posture and they also spend a lot of time sitting too. So if we look at the picture on the left, we're looking at the right leg. And at the top, we're looking at the pelvis where that's the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve comes out of five segments and the lower spine forms one segment which travels down the back of the leg. And you'll see about where it gets to the knee, the, the, um, the nerve splits. 
and it goes to um, down into the calf and then down all the way into the heel. So when we have someone that comes in with very specific complaints of maybe pain behind the knee or in the front or side of the thigh or in the heel, and they also have some lower back complaints, we're usually thinking about maybe this is a compression of that sciatic nerve um, that's causing some of those symptoms. Now, one of our differential diagnoses is to figure out, is this a nerve problem coming from the spine or is it a muscle problem? So if you look at the right side picture, you'll see, again, we're looking at that pelvis and you can see some red areas, which are muscles. There's that yellow nerve again. And sometimes we can get some compression on the nerve by having a tight muscle in the hip. So when we, we're looking at certain things, we're finding, do we find some hip restriction maybe some limited range of motion, limited function. Now we're thinking maybe this might be more of a piriformis or a muscle problem that's causing the problem versus a, a nerve problem coming from the spine. So we're gonna show you our next exercise. This is the, to stretch the, um, stretch the piriformis. And I'll show you this one. Begin by lying on your back with both knees bent and feet resting flat on the ground. Cross one leg over the other so your foot is resting on your knee. Grab your leg just below the knee and slowly draw it toward your opposite shoulder until you feel a stretch in your buttocks. Do not allow your back to twist or bend excessively during the stretch. So you can see that she's pulling that knee towards her opposite shoulder. This is usually a pretty comfortable stretch and one that uh, feels pretty decent in through the hip area. Um, and even it can be helpful with either problem, either the sciatic nerve being compressed in the spine or the muscle being tight in through the buttock. Um, it can be very, very helpful with both. So that, again, is a second exercise. You're laying right in bed. First one, bring the knee into the chest. Second one, bring that knee off to the other shoulder. So how do we work with sciatica? So, you know, when we, you'll see some similarities to the last treatment. Again, we do a lot of pain management talk. We do a lot of manual work by doing some massage and stretching and mobilization to the spine. We do some more posture work. We talk a lot about strength training. And then we also have a traction machine. So someone with specific spinal compression that's causing pain down their leg, uh, we can get some great results with putting them on a traction machine. The traction helps to just kind of distract the vertebrae takes pressure off that vertebrae in this on your back position. You can see from the top picture, uh, the gentleman's laying on the table with his legs up on kind of a little bench. And, um, and so that can be a very, very comfortable um, technique. We tend to get a lot of questions from time to time about inversion tables. So if you, if you spend a lot of time at night watching TV and you see some late night infomercials about the teeter or other um, inversion type tables, um, it, they're very popular. And so my general clinical feeling about an inversion table is I think they can be very helpful. Um, I do think though that they have to be managed correctly. And um, if you think of most of the time when you're using an inversion table, an inversion table is a table that is flat when it's um, at rest and you can get it on the table flat or you can get it on it standing up. And so basically what you're doing, you get on it flat, you're connecting your feet into the, um, to one part of the table, and then the table tips. <clears throat> so the feet are towards the ceiling, the head is towards the floor. And so many times people think they have to completely get vertical uh, by using one of those tables. And that's really not the case. A, a slight incline of maybe 30 to 40 degrees generally uh, is plenty to feel, to feel good with that. Um, so now a couple of my, um, so that's a pro for me is that, you know, most people can, they can get into the slight position, feel very good from using the table and they're very happy with it. 
some cons about that is though, is I think that sometimes some of our older clients that maybe have some dizziness, maybe some heart trouble or some heart issues, <clears throat> being in inversion is really not a very healthy thing for people with some of those problems. So I, I only recommend inversion work with someone who's younger, relatively healthy, maybe has kind of a very, a very um, either sedentary job or a very physical, de physically demanding job and they find that just from um, being in that position, it takes pressure off their back. So, you know, what, what I would say would be, you know, um, I never have anyone go out and buy a table. I always will say to them, hey, why don't you go find a friend who maybe has one, you can try it. But if you do have some dizziness issues or you're on a lot of heart medication, uh, I would encourage you to not even bother. So here's the, the last area that we generally deal with, and this is the, SI joint or more formally the sacroiliac joint. So this is a problem that we see in more of our younger clients. It's usually, it can be from, you know, teenage to about 20 years or older. This tends to be seen more in female than male. We tend to see this more in female because a lot of childbirth related um, maternity issues can lead to a lot of excessive mobility issues in the pelvis, which can lead to more pain. Their complaints are mostly in the lower back and in the buttock, very little time, so they have pain in the leg, and they'll have pain with sitting or with standing, and as I said, they don't usually have any pain in the leg. So with this group, <clears throat> we talk about the pelvic tilt, and I wanna show you that one. And again, lying down. So Begin something... by lying on your back with your knees bent and feet resting on the floor. Slowly bend your low back and tilt your pelvis backward into the floor. Then return to the starting position and repeat. Oops. So again, you can see I'm going to, she was loud, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to turn the volume down a little bit um, and just play that one more time. Look right in through here, and this is the movement where she's going to get most of the movement to come Begin from. Begin by lying on your back with your knees bent and feet resting on the floor. Slowly bend your low back and tilt your pelvis backward into the floor. Then return to the starting position and repeat. Make sure to only move your pelvis and low back and keep the rest of your body relaxed. So you can see there is not a lot of movement there and we're not lifting the hips off the, t the floor. It's just a little tilting type motion. That's all we're really looking to do is just getting that little bit of a tilt going. So, so those are your three exercises. And um, if you can see from my screen, you know, what I recommend with the first two is, you know, we, we do five in a row on both sides. We hold for a count of 20. The pelvic tilt, I encourage people to do that throughout the day. So if you're thinking about, you know, we can use the tilt when we're getting out of bed. And sometimes when you start to do these tilts, you'll notice it kind of helps your stomach muscles engage. They get a little tight and firm. So they're kind of protecting the lower back. So getting in and out of the car, getting in and out of the shower, getting off the toilet, walking up and down stairs, occasionally engaging and drawing in those muscles can be super helpful and reducing some lower back pain uh, because we're just not forcing the lower back to be active. We're actually forcing the abdominals to be more active. And that's many times what really helps the, um, the, the core muscles get stronger. So for us to treat SI problems, again, look at same things, pain management. We do a lot of work talking about pain management, a lot of breathing work. We do a lot of some corrective postural exercises, um, and we do a lot of stability training. So you see the gentleman here has got the band around his legs. We call this a clam exercise. And so he lifts his taut knee up into the band. It helps to get the hip muscles and the buttock muscles kind of firing a little bit more and gets them a little bit more active. A lot of people complain of some hip discomfort and more muscular discomfort when they start working on the SI because those muscles are, are super weak. And by doing the, that band exercise, they get some resistance and they get stronger. 
you know, and then we, we actually also um, encourage them to avoid some things like sitting cross-legged, you know, although it's great for ladies to sit cross-legged, sometimes it's not the best thing for your SI joint. And so we'll just encourage them just to be careful about either sitting cross-legged or sitting, uh, a lot of women have a tendency to sit with the leg crossed while uh, underneath them when they're sitting in a chair. And those positions just aren't great for the SI joint because it can put a lot of stress in that area and we encourage them to avoid that. So you've heard me say the word posture already a bunch of times. Um, that's super important. We spend a lot of time talking about posture on a daily basis. And, um, and as always, you know, I always say, uh, your mom was right. Sit up nice and tall, sit up straight. And that's super important uh, to make sure that they get up nice and tall. So you'll see here um, that far right hand picture shows the young man in kind of a really great looking posture. And the other four are just postures that we generally tend to see a lot when it comes to people coming in the office. And so what we'll generally tend to see is that the, the lumbar lordosis be increased when there's some abdominal weakness in the front. And then these, the thoracic kyphosis is that upper back area just comes forward and then the forward head becomes forward too as well. So we see that very frequently, that posture is very common in our office. And we talk a lot about trying to get out of those bad postures and spending more time in the good posture. Now, it is impossible for anyone to walk around like that guy on the right, it's not gonna happen. But what I say to people is I want you to occasionally think about getting out of your chair if you're at work and think about changing your posture so that way you can work on just getting yourself out of these bad postures and spend some time in a better posture. But it's really difficult to spend, you can't spend all day like that unless you're working in the military, I would say. So an area that we talk a lot about is what we call the lordosis. And the lordosis is in the lumbar area down lower. And you can see with the, the gentleman who has had probably too many chicken wings and beer and the young girl who's by the pool, they have too much of a lordosis. And we want to see a little bit of a curvature, but we don't want to see excessive. And so those people have a tendency to be very, very weak. They're not very strong. And they can also be very tight because they're just muscles just aren't, aren't moving well. The woman that's in the center picture, you'll see she's very rounded in her shoulders. Her back is very flat. Her head is forward. We're going to encourage her to try and pull her shoulder blades back, draw in her core muscles and engage them, and then just stand with better posture. So, um, you know, it, we don't want too much and we don't want none at all. We like to see a little bit right in the middle. It's the old Goldilocks thought process. And, you know, of course, we see a ton of our, our clients now are sitting at work. And now with COVID, you know, we're spending more time sitting at home. So we might have been at work before, had a wonderful ergonomic workstation that was great for us. And now we're on a laptop at our dining room table or a kitchen table or the countertop or on the couch. And it just leads to some bad postures. So... And the top pictures, you'll see it's the same lady. And I always joke with my patients and I show them this. I say, you know, the one on the left is you at four o'clock in the afternoon. And the one on the right is you at 730 in the morning when you first walked in the door. And so what we're trying to do is say, listen, spend less time like the one on the left, spend a little bit more time like the one on the right. And then you'll see below, there's some things to think about with posture while at work. You can see the gentleman is sitting in a good supportive chair. He has his arms supported on the armrest. He sits with his computer right at eye level. So if you think about if you're using a laptop on your dining room table, um, your head might be tilted down too much, which can put some extra stress on your neck or upper back. So trying to have yourself in somewhat of a good setup is really important. Um, I have a son who is working now and he lives, um, in uh, works in Manhattan and lives in New Jersey. And he came home for a few months when COVID was going strong and he worked out of his house and uh, out of my house when, when he came home and he said, dad, we got, I need some help. My, my, I just need a better workstation. What can we do? 
And we kind of really rigged something up. We had a couple of boxes. We put his monitor on a box so we could stand for a while. And we put his keyboard up on another box so we could sit and be more comfortable. So there's really a lot of things you can do to kind of get yourself into a better position when you don't have the fancy ergonomic um, setup at home. But, you know, one of the things we do recommend all the time, and when you come into my office, you'll see my office all has these adjustable tables. And so we do recommend a lot of standing. You know, we want people to not sit for a time. We want them to spend some time sitting, some time standing. And you can see that the picture on the left is kind of a general standing ergonomic setup. But on the right, what we have is a, a product that from a company called FlexiSpot. And so what that is, is if this is in the elevated position, but it can be lowered. So that way a person can sit and do their work with it lowered. But then if they want to stand up, they push a lever on the side, they raise the whole cabinet up, and now they can stand and do their work on the computer and standing. Um, the nice thing is the price points of these is, you know, they're coming down, but they're in that $250 to $300 range. You know, I always say to people, you know, always ask your boss, maybe there might be some reimbursement for you if you get something like this for your home. Maybe your, your boss will help reimburse some of the costs of this so that way you can be more comfortable at home and which only leads for you to be more productive. So, you know, many times people say, well, should I stretch or am I, am I too weak? Or, you know, I don't feel stable. I feel things shifting all over the place. And so what do I do? And, you know, when we look at spine problems, we think of them in, to be in two different scenarios. The first one being what we call hypomobile or being too tight. Um, and so we spend a lot of time with that person, teaching them how to stretch their lower back, teaching them how to stretch their hips. If you think about the lordosis picture we looked at a few slides ago, that's that lady in the middle. She just doesn't have a lot of bend in through her hips. Her back is very flat. She can't probably engage her core very well. So we talk about breathing, we talk about engaging the core. We really get them trying to be loosened up through the hips and through the back. And then if we think about that lordosis picture again, there was that young lady poolside who had that big sway in her back and it looks like this young lady on the computer or upside down practically. You know, those are people we don't want them to stretch. They're already too loose to begin with. So sometimes when you're too loose and you stretch, it just makes it worse. So we spend a lot of time teaching them how to engage their core muscles, how to get their back stronger, how to get their hip and their abdominal muscles much more stronger, which makes them now feel more stable and have a lot less discomfort. So again, do we stretch or not? And so, you know, what we say is if you are tight, we definitely want you to stretch. And look at, there's the middle picture. This is the guy doing single knee to chest. We talked about that earlier. Um, we can also use some other tools like the top picture has a foam roller. She's rolling on a roller. The person in the middle on the right is actually leaning against a lacrosse ball. And so sometimes leaning against a hard ball can be really very comfortable. It, sometimes it, it hurts so good at first, but then as you go along, it actually feels much better. And then there's these things with a young lady down the bottom where she's using a massage stick to create some uh, movement through her shoulder blade. We use that a lot, mostly through the thighs and the legs, but it can also be very comfortable through the upper back. And <clears throat> so, you know, should you warm up? Should you cool down? You know, what should you do? Should I stretch before I walk? Should I not stretch? What should I do? And I always say, you know, it's really up to you and it's based on what feels better. So when we talked earlier, we said we start some stretching and then we encourage people to do a walking program. And I'll say to them, listen, if you want to on one day, why don't you try to do your stretches first before you walk and see how that goes. And then the next day you're gonna go walk. Why don't you walk and then try your stretches after that. And then you can get a sense of which day did it feel better? Was it better when I stretched before I walked or was it better when I walked and then I stretched? So it becomes up to you, how does it feel? And you know, it really is all about the core. And here is a, a great picture of looking at the person from the front. And what you can see is there's actually multiple layers of abdominal muscles that kind of layer on top of each other. 
So you can see from the left side of the picture, there's the transverse abdominis. That's a very deep muscle that really helps to move the spine. And these abdominal oblique muscles, some of them angle from down to up and some of them angle from up to down. And then what lays on top of those is the rectus abdominis muscle. So you can see this, these three layers of muscles working in concert to keep the spine stable and to keep the abdominal muscle strong. And what we find is when we get people in the clinic, these muscles are very inactive. They're very weak. They are not strong at all. That leads to a lot more discomfort and instability in the spine. We can't talk about the core and not talk about the lower back. And we cannot talk about the core and not talk about the hip and the buttock. And so the picture on the left, we're looking at the lower spine, below the ribs and above the pelvis are two muscles that are very, very active in stabilizing the lower back. The multifidus and the quadratus lumborum are really two fancy names for two very important muscles in the lower spine because when they're strong and healthy, they don't allow a lot of movement in the segments of the spine and they allow for better stability. And then on the right side, you can see we, we all know what the gluteus maximus is. That's the big butt muscle, right? But if we were to cut that away and look below it, there are 11 different muscles underneath the glute maximus that are playing some role in creating stability or in some cases instability into the spine area, depending upon the person and, and what their symptoms are. So when we talk about the core, we not only talk about the abdominal muscles, we talk about the lower back muscles, we also talk about the hip muscles and we make sure we try to get people to engage them all. <clears throat> so let's take a minute and we're just gonna talk about chronic pain. We see this quite frequently in our office. People don't come in and say, oh, I've had like three days of lower back pain. They generally come in and say, I've had like, you know, six weeks or six months or six years of pain. And so, we talk a lot with people about pain being normal. Pain is a normal response to the, the body uses when there's a problem. And I use this analogy of a hot stove. When you think of it, if you walked into the kitchen and, and the stove was on and hot and you didn't realize it, and you went to put your hand on the stove, your body will never allow you to keep your hand on the stove. It's always gonna be, oh, that's hot. That's, I'm gonna stay away from that hot stove. I'm gonna guard and stay away from that. So many times what we see is when people come in, they're in this constant state of guarding, this tightness and protection. And <clears throat> when we see that with them, we talk to them a lot about that guarding, that protection is almost doubling the level of pain that they have. And so we want them trying to spend some time, trying to breathe, trying to get their body to relax a little bit more through some gentle movements, through some walking, and then getting the pain levels to reduce after that um, by doing some treatment and doing some strength training. So I also talk a lot about what I call tweaky things, you know, and uh, we'll start treating people and They'll come in the office and we'll say, well, how, you know, how are you feeling today? What's going on? Tell me how your weekend was. And they'll say, well, you know what? I was doing really well. And then I, I was just standing there and I got this sharp pain in my leg. And it just came on and it lasted for like 30 seconds. And then it went away and it didn't come back. And I was like, that freaked me out. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if I should do anything. Should I do my exercise or whatever? And, and I'll look at them very, very uh compassionately and I'll say do you know what that is and they'll like no what is it and I'm like it's a tweaky thing and some people laugh and some people look at me like what what is this guy saying and I say it's a tweaky thing because honestly we don't really know what caused that sharp 30 seconds of pain in the leg it could be a lot of different things that causing that to occur the most important thing for me though is that I'm really concerned when it becomes a trend a tweaky thing is something that comes and goes. It could be some compression of a nerve. It could be the disc just being a little bit compressed. It could be a muscle that's a little tightened in spasm. It could be a joint that's not moving well. It could be all of the above. It could just be one. So, but 
if it only happens once and it goes away, we try to get people to disregard those thoughts. That way they're not constantly going, oh my God, I can't do, I know what to do because I'm going to make it worse. And it's super important for them to learn that pain is normal and that how we respond to pain is going to help us either get better faster or get better slower. So it's super important for us to be careful with guarding. For those of you that are sitting there today and you're having some level of discomfort, you'll find that when you have that and you're guarding, it just the tension increases and it just can be really dreadful. So try to spend some time getting <clears throat> in what I call a, just a recovery position, which could be laying in a fetal position or laying on your back with your back supported or putting a couple of pillows in between your knees laying on your side or a couple of pillows underneath your knees when you're laying on your back. Different things like that can be really super helpful and that would then allow you to just kind of sit and do some breathing. So, you know, many times what we see with people in this chronic pain is <clears throat> they're stuck in this cycle. And you can see from the screen, they have an increase in their pain. <clears throat> that leads to a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern. Um, they're wondering about, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong? Do I have cancer? Some, something bad. Most people worry about it's something bad. They start to worry about their work and whether or not they're gonna be able to work to make money to bring it home to the family. This anxiety and pain issues leads to sleeping problems, can lead to some issues with maybe they start to over-medicate themselves. Maybe they're starting to have some relationship issues with their spouse or significant other. And then it leads to all these other problems, financial concerns, having to see the doctor more frequently, and they just can't cope with it. They just can't, they don't have strategies to learn how to cope with it. And that just leads to more pain and the cycle just continues. So we're really, we really spend a lot of time talking with our patients that pain is normal and we want them to know that, is, that it is normal, <clears throat> but they have to do some things to help control pain. That's very important. <clears throat> and one of the first things we'll do is we'll speak about breathing. What you see in the picture is your diaphragm. And you can see the diaphragm looks like a parachute. It sits in between your lungs and your abdomen. Many times when we think about breathing, we rarely use the diaphragm. And this is an easy way to try to start learning how to do some mindful breathing, which I'm a big fan of. I try to spend about 10 minutes every morning in my room, quiet, just breathing, get myself centered get myself just ready for my day. And so we'll have people lay on their back to start with, place one hand on their chest, one hand on their stomach, and then ask them to start breathing. And many times when we think of breathing, we think of our lung, lungs expanding out this way. And the intention of diaphragmatic breathing is not thinking about breathing this way, but of breathing down this way. So we let our lungs inflate but by letting our lungs inflate downward, it lets our abdomen rise up. We breathe out and lets our abdomen fall. So you know you're doing some good diaphragmatic breathing when one hand on the stomach is inflating and moving up when you breathe in and then going down as you breathe out. And the chest area is nice and quiet. So when you start, what you might find is that there's a lot of movement from the chest and very little movement from the lower hand and the abdomen. We want to reverse that. We want to keep the abdomen moving high and coming back down and letting the chest area be nice and quiet. So this is a great thing you can try later on. It's just, um, and we actually have a handout on this and I'll, we'll have Allie send this along too as well. So you'll have that. But just being in a comfortable position on the couch or in your favorite chair and just focusing on your breathing makes you kind of sometimes forget about the pain that you're having. And it can be very, very helpful and very powerful to get you feeling better. So many times our fitness goals revolve around physical therapy exercise. So as we talked about, we talked a lot about posture and, foot and stretching. We want people doing that a lot. We want them getting out, walking around the neighborhood, riding an exercise bike, swimming in their pool, doing something that's very active um, aerobically as well. So. We want them stretching on the floor, but we also want them out and walking. And then we really need them to get stronger. So we encourage some movement with resistance, either balls or bands or weights. And so 
it's a comprehensive program that we build for our patients that involves these three sections. And we help them say, listen, why don't you try this on this day, try this on that day, and maybe on this day you could do two things instead of just one. And we help them kind of plan that and, and strategize how can they best fit exercise into their daily routine. You know, so this is the part of the of the presentation where I say to you, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, generally there's three things that most of us will, we can do. One is simple. We just ignore it. We just live with it. We just go, it's, we can't change it. It's nothing we can do. So I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to live with it and I'll be fine. The second thing we can do is to try and change it maybe make some adjustments with what we do in our lives. The third and most important thing is we decide to handle it. Out of all those three things, the first one, ignoring it to me, is a, the worst thing we can do. It's the worst thing we can do. Pain is going to always be there in our lives. If we ignore it, it just compounds and gets worse. We really need to start thinking about how can we alter and change it. And the best way to do that is to think, say to yourself, how can I handle my back pain? And who can I talk to that will help me handle that? And we might be it and we might not be. But coming tonight is your first step to try and make a change to start to handle your problem. And I give this analogy, another story for you. And this is a, from a, another physical therapist that I know he's down in Pennsylvania. He's been very successful. He has an office that's in a strip mall. There's four different um, little shops in this strip mall. And he kept seeing one of his ceiling tiles. It would rain hard. And one of the ceiling tiles would always have some stains on it. And at first he was kind of like, I'm just going to leave it. I'm so busy with everything else. I'm just going to leave it. And then he had patients going, you, you see the ceiling tile is all wet. You probably should do something about that. And he was like, ah, yeah, I, I will, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And then finally he was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and change it. So we went to Home Depot. And what does he do? He buys a stack of ceiling tiles and he just replaces the ceiling tile. But what did that, what happened with that? It kept dripping, something was dripping, kept leaking on the ceiling tile, staining the ceiling tile. So he's like, you know what? I really gotta handle it. I gotta do something to handle this problem. So he went and called his roof guy and his, got the roof guy and he says, hey, what do you think is going on? Uh, can you help me figure this out? I got this leak. And he says, you know what? I really think this is your HVAC problem. It's an air conditioner problem in the, in the you know, above the roof. So he calls his HVAC guy. And of course, just like how we deal with stuff at home, what does the HVAC guy says? It's not my problem. It's the roof. It's got to be the roof. So now he's like, oh, what do I do now? So he has another friend who was a roofer. He says, will you just kind of help me tell, tell me figure this out? And the roof, the roofing guy was great. He went and he went up on the roof, went into the attic space and did all this stuff. And he said, I found the problem. He goes, it's not where your suite is. It's one that's three suites down. So the, the suite on the end of the building had a leak. And because of the trusses in the roof, the leak followed down all these pieces of wood and ended up in his office. The roofing guy went up on the roof patched up the hole and the guy never had a problem ever again. He got to the point where he just got sick and tired of dealing with this problem. He decided to handle it and he got it done. That's what I really want you guys to think about as you leave the presentation tonight. What are you going to do to handle the problem? So, you know, many times we go to the doctor first and we say, hey doc, my back hurts. Now what? What do I do? They'll do a clinical exam. And my hope is that they're gonna recommend physical therapy. Most of you are seeing your primary care. Generally, that's their first method of, of attack is to say, go to physical therapy or see a chiropractor, get some massage, do a treatment and see how that goes. They usually don't do an MRI unless you've had greater than six weeks of sciatica. So you remember that, that study we talked about from 1994? That's, um, that's why they said is, you know, unless you have really bad symptoms, they're not going to probably do an MRI. You, we don't want our patients on opioids. You all know about the opioid crisis and how it's affected our whole country. The worst thing you can do is get on pain medication. It leads to too many other issues that are not positive. And so we strongly encourage people to get off of opioids faster as soon as they can. And then, you know, what I never want to hear the doctor say is, don't worry, your back pain will go away. Because that's the worst thing, because guess what? It will go away, but then what happens? It comes back. 
and then it comes back for a while and then it goes away and it comes back. So you ride this roller coaster of pain and then no pain and pain and no pain. That's awful. That is not handling the problem. That's just ignoring the problem. So if you came to see us, what we do is we assess your problem. We assess every individual individually. We, it's not a cookie cutter approach. We find what's going on. We start looking at trying to develop a treatment plan and then we get you going with some treatment and some exercise. And it involves all those things we've been talking about, posture work, strengthening exercises, and even some balance training. Allie earlier, when she opened up the presentation, said something about a free screen and something about a PT evaluation. So <clears throat> we do offer a free screen. It's a 30 minute assessment. It's free. There's no insurance uh, billing or anything like that. If you're curious about physical therapy and you're not sure whether or not it's for you, this is a great way for you to see if it would be for you. You meet with one of my physical therapists and they take you through three or four tests that give them an idea of what they think is going on. Usually one of three things will happen. One, they'll show you some exercises because it's a minor problem and encourage you to do some exercises on your own at home. Two, they may say, you know what, we probably would benefit from having you come in the clinic. We can do some treatment and teach you some exercises, and we think that's the best plan of care. Or three, it's going to be, you know what, I think there's something else going wrong medically with you, and I think we need to get you back to the doctor. So let's get you back to the doctor. We'll talk to them about some, some exams or tests that they can do so we can further figure out what's going on. <clears throat> And when we do the screen, we always get your doctor's information so we can send them the report. We want your doctor knowing what we found so that they can be informed about what's going on with you. A more thorough assessment is where we do an actual evaluation where we use your medical insurance and we do a full 60 minute evaluation. This involves a lot more questions and answers. It involves a lot more examination and we determine what's exactly going on with you, and we talk to you about what's the plan to help you get better. Um, if it's a minor problem, usually the screen can do the trick. If it's something a little bit more advanced or you've had it for a long time, I generally recommend the evaluations better just because we can spend more time to determine what's going on and get you going in the right direction. Now, right now, um, the nice thing is people are coming back and they're getting out and they're doing some things, you know, getting out of the COVID, you know, staying in my house only, and they're getting out of the house. And it's led us to be very busy in our practice. The problem we have is because of physical distancing issues, we can only see so many people in the clinic. So because of that, it's kind of made us have a little bit of a wait time to get in. So what I'm gonna encourage you to do is if you're interested, give us a call. Allie's here in the morning. I have my office manager, Kim. And then we've got a couple of great um, students that work with us to help cover the phones. Any one of them can help you with more information and help you understand what's going on and, and whether or not physical therapy is a good fit. So that's our phone number there. Call the office, 508-393-9000. Someone can talk further about how we can help you and help you get an appointment set up. So be patient with us because we're doing our best to get people in as quickly as possible. And then there's some of you that maybe don't want to come in the office. And we have been doing uh, a lot of telehealth visits and it's been very successful for us. So basically, if you have access to the internet in your home and you have a computer, it could be a smartphone, it could be a laptop, it could be a desktop computer. We, uh, even a tablet works great. We um, can do a remote call with you where we can talk through all the issues we have we can figure out what's going on and then we can just do some things by telehealth, by some video work and get you going in the right direction. The one drawback of that is we don't do our manual work. We can't do that. But many times we can teach you all of the exercises you can start doing at home. You can start working on them. We'll give you some training on things to do and not do. And it's a, it's a great second alternative if you're still a little concerned about COVID-19 and you don't want to leave your home. So, um, that's all I've got for to talk about tonight. Um, what I want to do is um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, what I want to do is see Allie. I don't know if you pulled up the chat. Does anyone have any questions in the chat box at all? 
There are no questions in there yet. All right, good. Okay. Um, well, so we're gonna. I'm gonna stay on the call a little bit longer. If anyone has a question or concern, feel free to throw them out there. Um, if not, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and participating and, and being active. And again, if you're interested further, uh, feel free to call our office. Again, it's 508-393-9000. Um, Allie and some of my other staff would be very happy to help you out with anything you need to learn about what is your insurance cover, what does it take to do a free screen, what does it take to, to do some physical therapy. So, um, so if there are no other questions, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and I hope you all have a great night and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Allie, thanks so much and, and uh, for coming and getting us all set up and everyone have a great night. Bye.